I'm glad we're having church today. Uh, well, two people, two people are glad we're having church today. I'm glad we're having church today. <laughs> well, I'm super excited what God has in store for all of us today. I'm super excited about the message that God's got in store. This is a message that, and, and something that God revealed to me a long time ago. He spoke it, and it's been on my heart for a long time. And it's crazy how you read scripture and sometimes certain things stick out to you that you've never seen before, you've never heard before. And that's what happened to me several years ago. And so when we decided to do this series on David, I said, mark it down, one of the weeks is gonna be about this because it's something that revolutionized and changed my life for the good. And so today I pass it on to you guys and I pray that the Spirit speaks just like he spoke to me, and I believe he will, because we just surrendered it to him, amen? We just surrendered today to him, and so he's going to speak. Well, we are in a series called David. How many of you have enjoyed the series? Have you gotten anything out of it? Has the Spirit already moved and spoken? Yeah, um, they're super excited that we've been able to spend some time together looking at the life of David, his life takes up a lot of space in scripture, so it's, it bears paying attention to. And so there's so many verses and references and chapters to the life of David, and it's been our goal to look at his life, things in his life, stories in his life, whether they be good stories where he succeeded or maybe bad stories where maybe he messed up and stumbled, didn't do the right thing. We can still learn from those situations as well. And so we've been looking at those different stories, and we're going to wrap up our time in David today. So today is the series finale, if you would have. And so I know a lot of us are looking forward to our TV shows starting back, and we have season premieres coming up, but this is the series finale for David today. And it's a message called Don't Cut Corners. We're talking today about Don't Cut Corners. And like I said, over the last couple weeks, if you're kind of new or if you haven't been here in a few weeks, we've been in this series called David, and if you read his story, one of the first things we talked about in the first week was that David was a man after God's own heart, and we've been looking at David's life, seeing different things that we can take from his life and apply to our lives so that we can look a little bit more like a man or a woman after God's own heart. And I don't know about you, but I look at the world around us, and I believe our world could use a few more men after God's own heart, a few more women that are after God's own heart. There's so many things that are going on in our world today that we're trying to do things our own way and not God's way. And I believe this, if we listen to what God says in his word, then we can look a little bit more like men and women that are after God's own heart. See, David made up his mind early on that he was gonna be surrendered to God no matter what it takes, no matter what happens, he was gonna be a man after God's own heart. David was gonna be surrendered to the process because God gave him a promise. And that's what we looked at in week one, that God gave him a promise early on when he anointed him to be king. He said, I'm giving you a promise that you're gonna be the next king of Israel but it was the process that David had to walk through that we're gonna look at today. And I know we've jumped around over the last couple weeks in David's story, but today, just to get you caught up so you know where we're at, and then we kind of started at the beginning of David's story, and then we kind of jumped to the middle and jumped to the end, and then jumped back to the middle and then jumped back to the end again. So we've kind of been all over his life. We haven't really tackled this necessarily in chronological order. And so just to get you caught up, David, when he was young, we don't know quite how old he was. He was in his early teen years probably. The prophet Samuel went to David's house, and he anointed David as the next king of Israel. But he was too young. I don't know how many 13, 14-year-olds we really want being king or being president. And so it wasn't David's time yet. And so David goes back out into the fields and he continues to serve his father, David, even after he's been anointed king, even after he's been given a promise, David goes back out into the field and continues to serve his dad. And then the story kind of continues and David gets called in to actually serve the current king of Israel, King Saul. He starts serving King Saul in the court and different things happen. 
David starts to gain some traction. He starts to gain some notoriety. Some people start to kind of take notice of David and say, man, this guy, is he's got a gift. He's got a natural talent to be a leader. He's super skilled at this thing. And he starts to gain a little bit of momentum and, and notoriety. And Saul takes notice, and he sees David as a threat on his throne. And so Saul begins to attempt to take David out. He, he starts trying to kill David, literally. He starts throwing spears at him. He starts hunting him like an animal. And so David goes on the run. He goes on the run, and for years he's running from Saul. He's been given a promise, but it's not his time yet. And so he's running from Saul, trying to literally stay alive so that he can one day step into the promise that God had on his life. And so that's where our story finds us today. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 24 if you have your Bible here today, or if you use the Bible app, if you're a technology nerd, then you can pull that out and follow along. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to start reading in verse 1. It says, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines... He was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. Well, let's stop right there. Let's, let's get a little bit of context of where David at. Where, where is David? David is in the desert. Rather, he's in the wilderness. That's what some translations say. So David is in the wilderness. And if we know anything from reading Scripture and studying Scripture, the wilderness represents something. The wilderness represents a place of testing, a place of training, and preparation. That's where men were stretched. That's where people were stretched with, with God. They, they were stretched in their walk with God. And so David's in the wilderness. God is in the process of preparing David for the throne. See, remember, David had a promise. He had a promise, but he wasn't going to be ready for the position until he walked through the process. You follow me? So David He's been given a promise that he's going to be the next king of Israel, but he's not going to be ready for that position until he walks through the process. And what I've found out is a lot of times when we find ourselves in the wilderness, when we find ourselves in seasons of struggle and seasons of uncertainty and, and hopelessness, and we don't really know what's going on, it seems like God is so far away from the picture, he's, he's nowhere to be found. Sometimes when we're in those seasons, when we're walking through the wilderness, we seem to forget the fact that we have a promise on our life. We sort of seem to forget that God has given us a promise. Even though we have a book full of promises from God, we seem to forget it when we walk through those seasons that are tough. And so David remembered that I have a promise. I have a promise. And some of you need to remember today, and this is the first thing, you have a promise. You have a promise. Can you tap your neighbor on the shoulder and just tell him, I have a promise. I have a promise. Now look at the person that just tapped you on the shoulder and say, I got one too. I got one too if you're joining us online. Tell the people in the chat, I have a promise because you sometimes have to tell yourself something in order to really believe it because some of you today are walking through a season where it just seems like this is never going to end. This is never going to get any better. I don't know what's coming, God. I know you've given me a promise, but man, it just doesn't make sense right now. I just don't see it. I don't understand it. And we got to see where David's at. He's literally running for his life from Saul, and he's in the desert. He's probably really hungry. He probably hasn't had a shower in a while, and he probably smells really bad, and he's like, God, I don't understand what's happening. But see, he remembered and knew in the back of his mind, God's given me a promise. He's anointed me to be king. I might not understand what's going on right now, but he's given me a promise. See, when you're walking through the wilderness, you don't always understand why things are happening the way they're happening, but you have to remember, and it says this in Isaiah, it says that God's ways are not our ways, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. He's wiser beyond measure. We can never comprehend what he's doing because his ways are not our ways. He doesn't do things the way that we would do them. He doesn't think the thoughts that we would think, but there's a reason that he does that, and that's order, in order to fulfill his promise in our lives. So David, first thing is, he had a promise. He had a promise. And so we keep reading. It says, so Saul took 3,000 abled young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. So Saul gets word that, okay, we know where David is. Let's go get him. And so he gathers 3,000 men, 3,000 men to go after one man. 
3,000 men to go after one man. So Saul, he's not joking around. He's not fooling around. He sees David as a threat, and I'm going to squash this before it goes any further. And how many of you know this? When you're walking in God's purpose, when you have a promise on your life, the enemy is going to do whatever he can to squash what God is trying to do in your life. Amen? How many of you can testify that when you're walking in the promise of God, when you're walking in his purpose for your life, the devil is going to throw everything he can at you to stop you from fulfilling that purpose and that plan that God has on your life. And that's what Saul was doing. He was throwing everything he could at him. He was throwing everything he could at him. He said, I'm taking 3,000 men. I'm not joking around. We're not fooling around. We're going to deal with this once and for all, and we're going to be done with David. See, there was another king that also was attempted to be eliminated, and that was Jesus. Remember when Jesus was born, King Herod at the time, he tried to kill every baby boy in the region, two years and younger, to eliminate Jesus. But see, he had a promise on his life too. He had a purpose on his life too, and God spared him. He spared him from the enemy. See, the devil is going to do everything he can to derail you from your destiny whenever he gets a chance. And let me just throw this in there. If it feels like the devil's not after you, then it's time to have a checkup. It's time to have a checkup. Because if the devil's not after you, you're probably on his side. And that's the truth. That's a hard truth. But some of us, we, we get in the middle of the wilderness, we get in the middle of a, a trial, and we think, God, what are we doing wrong? But here's the thing, you're doing something right. When you're walking in step with God, when you're fulfilling the purpose that he has for your life, the devil is going to try everything he can to tear you down. Even though you have a promise and a purpose, the devil is going to push back however he can. So that's just kind of a little tidbit right there. That's not necessarily where we're going, but y'all can put a little bit extra in the offering plate for that one. And so, anyway, let's keep reading because we got a long story to get to. We got a long story. We got a lot of ground to cover. So let's get on down here to verse three. It says this. It says, he came to the sheep pens along the way and a cave was there. And it says, and Saul went in to relieve himself. You get that? This is important. This is important. This is an important part right here. Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, I didn't really have to dig too far into the Greek and the Hebrew of what was happening right here. It's pretty clear what's happening. So please, I know there's some kids in the room. I don't really want to have to spell this out too much. But Saul with his men. They're on the way to get David. They stopped by Taco Bell. He had a little bit too much, and he said, boys, we got to pull over at the closest cave on the left. And so they pulled over, and they go into the cave, and Saul has to go. He said, boys, I need you to stay out here. You don't want to be in here with me, all right? I'll be okay by myself. I'm just going to go in here. I'm going to take care of business. But here's the thing. They went into, he went into the very cave that David is in. God set up a divine appointment for David. I know it doesn't seem very divine, right? When someone comes into the stall next to you, you're like, Lord, really? Why, can't, can't I just get done? One more minute, God. One more minute. I'll, I'll be done. I'll be done, and then they can have it. You know, we don't really like it when someone sits down next to us in the stall in the bathroom. But God has set up an appointment for David here in the cave. He set up a divine appointment. This area was full of different caves and different places that Saul could have gone to do his business, but God directs him to the very place where David is at. He set up a divine appointment for him. And so they're in the cave. Saul comes in. He's doing his, doing his deed, you know. Again, we don't want to have to get too specific. And David's men kind of tap David on the shoulder, and they're like, hey, Check it out. Look who's over there. He's got his pants down. God has brought Saul to you. David's men say, check it out. This, this is it. This is your opportunity. This is your chance to deal with Saul once and for all. And so David's got an opportunity. He's got a choice. And here's the thing. Sometimes we don't know really what's in our hearts until we have an opportunity. 
Sometimes we really don't know where we stand until we have a choice, until we have an opportunity to act. And so David's here. His men are like, this is it. God's set this up for you. This is your opportunity. This is your chance. And they say this. They say, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand for you to deal with as you wish. So they're in the cave. I don't really know how this played out. I don't, I don't, I don't, know. I don't know how they didn't see David and all his men because he had a lot of men with him. And so it must have been a big cave. I don't know. Really dark. And so David's men, they're over here in the corner. They're hiding. They're, they're trying not to be seen. Saul kind of comes in. You know, he's probably moving with haste, you know, because we got we to get this done. And, and literally, I'm going to do this because this is probably what he did, you know, because they didn't have toilets back then. There wasn't a toilet in the cave. And so he, he, he kind of does his thing. He's doing his, I don't know what it looked like. I don't know what it looked like. All right, so y'all just bear with me. If anybody's taking a picture for YouTube, this is the time to do it. All right, so he, he kneels down. He's doing his thing. He's vulnerable. He's in a position that is risky to what he has to do. Jimmy, I know you like this. You got your phone out. I'm a little scared. I don't know what's going on back there. But he's vulnerable. Saul's in the cave. He's doing his thing. And David's men tell him, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. And so David sneaks up somehow. And he sneaks up behind Saul I wish I had two people. You know, I like to bring people up for examples, but I figured this probably wasn't a good one. And so he sneaks up to Saul. And I don't know about you. If he's sneaking up from behind, that's the, that's the bad end of the deal to be on on this one. And so Saul's sitting there in the cave. And somehow David gets close enough. David gets close enough. He probably has a sword with him. And he gets close enough to Saul. He probably creeps down. He's being really quiet, being really stealthy. And he probably gets really close. And then David's got a choice. Remember, this is his opportunity. And David does something that David doesn't normally do. He does something really strange. He cut a corner. He cut a corner of Saul's robe. Now, David had a choice. David had a choice. He could have taken the sword and easily thrust it through Saul. And once he did that, once he did that, he would have supposedly, like his men thought, received the promise that God had given him. He would probably have been given the position of king. He would have ascended to the throne. He had enough of a following. He had enough people behind him that all he had to do was one thrust of his sword through Saul, and he could have had what God had promised him. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He does something really odd and really strange, and he cuts a corner. He cuts a corner of Saul's robe. And then scripture says this. It says that David was conscious stricken. Check it out. It says, afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So why is that? Why was he feeling guilty for having not killed Saul. Because killing Saul would have been the wrong thing to do. But instead he cut a corner, and then scripture says that he felt bad about it. He felt bad about it. And here's, here's the key, and here's the part that I saw several years ago that I never noticed before. And I love this. I love how God puts stuff in his word. And again, sometimes you don't see it until the spirit really speaks. And it says this, back in verse 3, when we read through it a minute ago, it says, he came to the sheep pens. He came to the sheep pens. So the cave that God had appointed David and Saul to have this encounter right outside was the sheep pens. And I imagine this. I imagine David, again, he's sneaking up on Saul. He's, who knows? We don't know really what was in David's heart. It really doesn't matter what was going on in his mind, what he was tempted with and thinking about doing. What really matters is what he did. 
And I can imagine he's there, he's behind Saul, and he's probably putting a lot of thought into this. This is a big choice. This is a big decision he's got to make. And I imagine, since it's quiet, he hears the sheep outside. He hears the sheep outside. And if you know about David's story, the sheep were a very familiar sound. Because the sheep pens and being a shepherd was where David was when God called him. When God gave him the promise, he was with the sheep. And so right now, David is literally positioned between where he got the promise and then the position of which he was promised. He's literally positioned between the two. And what we know is when God gives us a promise, He's promised the position, but we have to walk through the process. And that's where David's at. He's in the wilderness. He's been given a promise that he's going to have a position. But right now, he's in the middle. He's in the process. He's in the process. God is doing something. And as he knelt there behind Saul, as he knelt there and he made his decision, he remembers I'm in the process. Yes, God's given me a promise, but I'm in the process. And so in order for him to get the position that God had promised him, he first had to go through the process and honor the process. David recognized this. This is our second point. You need the process. You need the process. Yes, God's given you a promise. He's given you a purpose. But you have to go through the process to get to the position. And that's where David's at. And again, we don't like it when we're in the wilderness. We don't like it when we're walking through those things, but we need that process in order to be prepared for the position. See, we don't, we don't like that, right? That makes us feel uncomfortable. We love the promise all day long. We'll sing songs all day long, right, about the promise, but we don't have a lot of songs about the process. We love that song. You are the God of the promise. You are the God of the process. That doesn't sound as good. I don't like that. I'm not going to sing that out loud. I'll sing about the promise, but I'm not going to sing about the process. I don't like wandering in the wilderness. I don't like seasons of testing. But here's the thing. You have to have the process in order to step in to the position that God has promised you. You have to have it. We, we don't, we don't, like the process, we like the promise, we like the platform, we like the prestige, we love all the things that come along with the promise, but we don't like walking through all the things that get us the promise. And you can mark it down. You don't want a position, even if God's promised it, you don't want a position that God hasn't fully prepared you for. You don't want that position. You want to be fully prepared and ready for it when God comes good on his promise. You need to be faithful through the process. There's, there was a time when I was coming up as a worship leader, I went to a conference. And it's, it's a conference that happens up at Passion City Church. And if you've lived here in Atlanta, you probably know about Passion City Church, big church on the north side of Atlanta, pastor by Louis Giglio, and this was years ago. I was young, I was a worship leader at a church, part-time, didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I went to this conference and I was sitting in a breakout session. And it's funny how you remember these moments, right? That just kind of lock into your brain. They become just catalyst moments in your life. And I was sitting there in this breakout session and Louis is kind of talking back and forth with Chris Tomlin, a well-known worship leader. And they're sitting there kind of dialoguing back and forth. And they talked about how a lot of people send in, like, music. And they'll send in songs and like, hey, would y'all listen to this? Would y'all have Chris Tomlin record this song? 
make me popular. And they, what do we have to do to be like Chris? How can we be successful like Chris? How can we get the fan base? How can we get a tour? How can we do all these things to be like Chris Tomlin? Because, you know, every worship leader wants to be the next Chris Tomlin. Justin picks on me all the time because he thinks that I'm Chris Tomlin's fanboy for some reason. I don't understand. I don't really ever talk about Chris Tomlin other than right now, and he's probably going to give me a hard time when we watch this message back. But anyway, they, they want to know, how can I be more like Chris Tomlin? And I remember Louis said this. He said, a lot of people want the platform that Chris has. A lot of people want all the things that they see from the outside when it comes to the success that Chris has and how God's blessed him. But he said, what you don't see is the weight that he carries, being the flag bearer, the songwriter of a generation, a songwriter for not just the American church, but the global church in general, the weight that comes along with that, the, the, the exhaustive hours it takes to be with God and write these songs and then also tour and, and go and share these songs with the church. It's, he says it's, it's a position that unless you know Chris personally, you don't know the weight that comes along with that. And not everybody is cut out to carry that weight. Not everybody is cut out to carry that weight. And he likened it to the parable of the talents in the New Testament that Jesus told. He said some, he gives 10 talents, and some he gives five, and some he gives one. And God calls, and he gives you whatever he wants to give you, because he's God, he can do whatever he wants to do. And he prepares certain people for certain jobs, and he equips them for it. He prepares them for the position that he has for them. And I remember hearing that at that conference, and I'm like, okay, God, I get it. Whatever you want to give me, I'm just going to be faithful with it and try to multiply it. Whatever that might look like. It might not look like sold-out tour dates. It might not look like arenas. It might not look like big conferences that I get to lead worship at. But whatever you give me, I'm going to try to be faithful with it. Because you don't ever want a position that God hasn't prepared you for. And he prepares you through the process. And so David, again, as he's there in the cave, as he's kneeling behind Saul, as he has a choice whether to take Saul out or to let him live, he remembers, I'm in the process. I'm in the process. And he knew that he was destined to be king, but he also knew that I'm not ready for that position yet. God has not fully prepared me for it. See, God gives the promise. God prepares us. And when we're ready, God gives the promotion. God gives the promotion. God provides for his people. Remember what David's men said. What David's men said when Saul came into the cave. They're like, hey, David, this is your opportunity this is the opportunity that God has given you. And, and look, look what they said. Look at what they told him. Let's go to verse 4. Let's put up on the screen. It says, his men said this. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Read this really closely. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Now, there's quotes inside of quotes right here. So the men are quoting something, but what I think it is, I think it's a misquote. <laughs> because you can read the Bible, you can look in there, nowhere, nowhere did God tell David, I'm going to deliver Saul into your hands, and I'm going to let you do with him what you want to do. Nowhere. That was not the deal. If you look back in Scripture, you actually find the opposite. When God goes to Samuel and, and tells him that, hey, you need to go to Saul and tell him he's messed up one time too many, and I'm taking the kingdom from him, and I'm going to give it to another man. I'm going to give it to another man, because I have sought out a man that's after my heart. It's me 
that's going to remove Saul, and it's me that's going to put the next king in play. Nowhere, nowhere in Scripture does God say, David, one day you're going to be in a cave, Saul's going to come in, he's going to be very vulnerable, and you're going to be able to take him out however you want to do it, and then you're going to be able to step in and become king. No, that wasn't the deal. That wasn't the promise. He said, I'm going to make you king. It's on me to do that. And so David knew that. See, if David would have listened to what his men were telling him, which I say is a partial truth, if, they would have, if he would have listened to what his men were saying, if he would have listened to a partial truth, David would have received a partial promise. He would have received a partial promise. And see, our God is not a God of the partial promise. He's the God of the full promise. Amen? What God promises us, he's going to make good on it. He's going to make good on it. And it's God that provides. We have to trust the process and know that what God promises us, he provides. What he promises us, he provides. And I love this. If you look back in Psalm 57, if you look in Psalm 57, this was a psalm that was written by David literally when he was in this cave going through the process, when he was in the middle of this test. Now, I don't know if he wrote it at the beginning or if he wrote it at the end. I don't know at what point he wrote this psalm, but he said this in verse two. He says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Not I cry out to God because he lets me fulfill the purpose that I want for my life when I want it, how I want it, where I want it. No, it's God who fulfills his purpose for me. It's God who's gonna accomplish this in me. Not me. It's God who's gonna do it. See, God has given each one of us a purpose on our lives, but sometimes the purpose is in the process. Sometimes we're tempted to take matters into our own hands and do things our own way because we're tired of the wilderness, we're tired of the struggle, we think that God's forgot about us, we think that all hope is gone, and so I guess, God, if you're gonna leave me here, then I guess I'll just have to deal with this on my own, and so we step in and we try to deal with it on our own. But no, God puts you in a position because you've been through the process that prepares you for that position. He's he's given you a promise. He's promised that he will never leave you and never forsake you. But sometimes when we're in the wilderness, we forget that. And we try to take matters into our own hands and do things our way. We try to do things our way. And so David's there. He's got the sword in hand. He's behind Saul and he's got an option. He's got an opportunity to do it his way. But no, he doesn't. He backs up and says, God, I remember that you are the God who provides. You are the God that gave me the promise. So I know you're going to give me the position. But until you give me the position, I'm going to be faithful in the process. I'm going to be faithful in the process. And that way, I'll be prepared for the position that you've promised me. Because without that, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's God who provides. Again, we try to do it on our own, but it's God who provides. We have to lastly switch our position. We have to switch the position See, some of you, some of you are running your life just like the bumper sticker that you see sometimes. It says, God is my (laughs) co-pilot. And that is not a good place to be in. I don't know why you would brag about that because if God's the co-pilot, that means you're driving the car or the plane or the whatever it is that you're going. If if God's the co-pilot, and you're in the driver's seat, you got it backwards. You need to switch your position. You need to let God into the driver's seat. You need to let God have the steering wheel, and you need to move over to the passenger seat. And if you're like some people, whenever things don't go quite right, you want to reach over and you want to take control of the steering wheel, maybe you need to move yourself into the back seat and let God drive your life. Let God determine what happens 
and what takes place in your life. You need to let him be the pilot. You take a back seat and don't ever reach over to that steering wheel and try to take control because if he's given you a promise, he will give you the position, but you just have to be faithful in the process. Amen? You just have to be faithful in the process. There's a story in the Old Testament. I love the story of Abraham. I love the story of Abraham because God gave him a promise. God gave him a promise. When he was really old, he promised him that he was going to have a son. He promised him that he was going to have a son. And it was hard for Abraham to believe, but God came through, provided Abraham a son, and he promised that nations were, and people were going to flow out of him that outnumbered the sand on the shore. He gave him a promise. He said, I'm going to bless you. I just need you to be faithful to me. And so God gives him a son. He makes good on his promise. And then God does something really strange. One day he tells Abraham, he says, hey, I need you to take your son. I need you to go and I need you to make a sacrifice. I need you to sacrifice the son that I promised you. And I love scripture because I don't know if there was a lot of dialogue back and forth between Abraham and God. Maybe there was, or maybe it's just like scripture plays out. And the next verse says that Abraham went. He took Isaac and they went to make a sacrifice. And they get to the place that God had told him to go and make the sacrifice. And as they're walking up the hill, Isaac, Abraham's son, looks over at him and he's, perplexed and confused. Maybe he had thought about this for a little while, and he says, hey, Dad, we've got everything we need here to make a sacrifice, but we don't have a lamb. And again, Abraham doesn't skip a beat. He looks at his son, and he says this. He says, God will provide. We just have to keep walking. And so Abraham and his son, they walk all the way up this hill. They build this altar. And through events that really aren't spelled out crystal clear, somehow Isaac ends up on the altar. And Abraham goes as far as to hold the knife over his son, his one son, the son that God had promised him. And it was through this son that he was going to multiply his people and bless his people. And he told Abraham to sacrifice him, and so Abraham's there. And I imagine he even went to go down. It says the angel of the Lord stopped his arm. God was saying, that's enough. That's enough. I know you trust me. Then Abraham hears something, and he looks over, and there's a ram caught in the thicket. There's a ram caught in the thicket. And so they go over, they get him out, they sacrifice that ram. The scripture says this, it says that Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Even though God does things in my life and allows things to happen in my life that I don't understand, even when he asked me to go to places that I don't fully understand what he's doing. I'm gonna follow, I'm gonna surrender to the process because I know God's given me a promise. And when he knows I'm ready, he'll put me in the position that I need to be in in order to accomplish the purpose he has on my life. There's a purpose in the process. So what corners are you trying to cut in your life in order to fulfill, yes, the purpose and the promise that God's given you, but you're trying to do it on your own? What corners are you cutting and trying to take control of your own life where God has said, it's up to me to fulfill the purpose 
that I have for you. Don't cut corners. Let God work through the process. Let him work. Let him do what he's going to do. See, David surrendered his life to the process. Whatever it takes, God, I'm going to stay true to the promise that you've given me. And when you're ready, you'll fulfill your purpose for me. That's what David said. In essence, he said, not my will, God. Not my will, not my way, but your will, your way. Sounds familiar. It sounds like what Jesus prayed in the garden. <laughs> Sounded like what Jesus prayed when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, right before he went to the cross. He was kneeling down to pray, and scripture says that he's sweating Tear, he's sweating drops of blood because of the stress that he's under, the weight he's carrying. He's, he's literally sweating drops of blood because of the process. Jesus was in the process and he prayed to God. He said, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me, can we do it that way? But nevertheless, nevertheless, your will be done. Your will be done. Jesus honored the process. Jesus wasn't just given a promise. He was the promise. He was the promise. And still, he walked through the process in order to accomplish the purpose that God, the Father, had for his life. I close with this scripture in Philippians 2. I love this passage. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I think this fitting because for the last six weeks, we've been looking at the life of David, seeing stories in David's life that we can draw things out of, draw application out of for our life. We're trying to get a little bit more like the heart of David. But here, the Apostle Paul says, have the mindset of Christ Jesus. So as we wrap up our time in this series, as we wrap up our time looking at the life of David, let's close with this. Have the mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, this is good. Therefore, because, wh why is that there? Because he made himself nothing because he took the very nature of a servant, because he was made in human likeness and he was found in appearance as a man, and he, because he humbled himself and became obedient to death, because he went into the process, because he submitted and surrendered to the process, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One person like that, I think more people should like that. Let's read it again. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to what? To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Even Jesus the Son surrendered to the process because that's what gave God the glory. Some of you today, you just need to surrender to the process. Know that God is working. He's moving in your life. You might not understand it. You might not get it, but God is moving in your life today. He's got a plan and a promise for you. You just have to submit to the process. Come on. Can we sing together? Can we worship together? God, we surrender to the process. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. 
If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.